if I fill myself up with positivity and good energy and, you know, and, and stillness and, and, and God and love, if I fill myself up with love, like that's what's going to pour off of me. Welcome to the Juggling the Chaos of Recovery podcast, where we focus on health and wellness and overcoming all types of addictions. You're in the right place if you're a mom, dad, sibling, or caregiver who has a loved one who is or was struggling with an eating disorder or any other kind of addiction. In a time where everything seems heavy, I'm here to bring you a very real yet lighthearted take on what the heck we're all supposed to do with our lives while we care for our loved ones who are struggling. One thing holds true throughout it all. You can't juggle the chaos without smiling, at least a little bit. Well, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. This is Moira Gorski. So glad you came back today. Uh, I'm so glad you are listening. Um, Just really, really grateful for all of you who are listening and um, grateful for the stories that I get to share with you because... um, Everybody has a story, and I feel like when we can hear other people's stories of struggle as well as recovery, it can really give us some hope, and that's really why I continue to do this podcast. Um, Today, I have my friend with me, uh, Laura Nosek, who I met at my local health club some many years ago, and I love so many things about Laura, but one thing that I love about what she did... uh, is she introduced me to yoga and she introduced me to this idea of being present. And boy, when I, and I don't know if you remember that, Lori, you probably don't even know, but um, you know, I stumbled into her uh, yoga room at my local health club and started practicing with her. And she, she always would talk about, it's gotta be present and breathe. And I was like, <laughs> I don't even know what you're talking about. Um, it was really hard for me. And um, I have come to love and appreciate yoga. I have certainly come to love and appreciate my guest, Laura. But I've just come to appreciate what it's, what it's like to be present and to be here and to breathe and have learned that yoga is not always about the practice. It's about how we can practice today to help us out in our life. So before I go any further, um, Laura Nosek is joining us today. So welcome to the podcast, Laura. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you so much, Moira. It's just my privilege to be here with you. Yeah. I love I love you and I'm just so pleased. I'm so happy to be here. Yes, thank you. And mm-hmm. unfortunately, I'm so glad to be connected and um, you moved out of town. And so it's so nice to be able to see you here. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, yeah, again, I love the, I don't know how many years ago and it really doesn't matter, but so many mm-hmm. years ago, um, I started to learn about yoga. And um, we'll talk a little bit about that later in the podcast, but just how, and it was a struggle for me in the beginning. And again, I don't know if you remember that, but because I'm just like a go, 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 and I'm a marathoner and I'm a runner and we just run a business and you just go. And that idea to come into a room and sit and it's like a workout, but it's not really, I don't know. I've just, again, have come to appreciate the practice of yoga so much. And I certainly, you were really my first teacher. So I appreciate Appreciate that. Um, That's your privilege. I love yeah. being. I love being your first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so as I've gotten to know Laura, I mean Laura has a story. She has a wonderful story of, you know, recovery into the beautiful woman that you are today. And I know that there's been struggles. And so I'm just again privileged to bring you here today so that you can share that story. Um, and so I just would like you to start that way and just share. Um, I know there's been eating disorder, there's been alcohol, there's been lots of struggles. And so if you can just Mm -hmm. share with us your story, and again, we don't talk about the down and dirty and all of those details, but just really kind of what you feel comfortable sharing about your story and really what you've learned. And um, we'll just start there. Yeah. Um, Well, I, when I think about my addictions, I always think about like, what was the, you know, the, the first moment that, you know, of, of emptiness really, because I heard somewhere that addiction um, was really another, another word for um, being disconnected, like a disconnection or a disconnection from your community or a disconnection from people or just a, it's a disconnection. 
And so I think about that. I'm like, where was I disconnected? I think that, and I think it was by choice. You know, when I was a young girl, um, I think the first time I felt like I wasn't a part of what was going on was when I was maybe, you know, maybe in third or fourth grade. And I just noticed that I, there was something different and I, I looked like everybody else in my classroom, but I had this feeling like I just wasn't a part of the group. And um, it was just like, okay, I'm just not a part of this. I feel like I'm not being included. I don't feel like I'm a part of, and it was like, as I think about it, I'm like, what was that? Was that my decision that I decided to exclude myself? Or was that just an overall feeling of just not being a part of and, you know, as I've kind of learned a little bit more about my addictions and, and through recovery and everything, it was that feeling, that feeling that I was different, that I was not a part of that. And that was inside of me and that had always been inside of me. So I realized that around that really young age, I mean, I don't even know what, how old are you in third grade eight, right? You're like seven or eight, eight or nine. And um, from that moment on, I sort of already began doing things that and this is normal kids do this they do things that you know because they're looking for something so they're doing things to be accepted by their group by their peers by their teachers by their parents and so um I just started becoming like everybody else and I started figuring out that oh I gotta be someone else I gotta be like that person if I want to be liked or if I want to even say more, it, it was like, I got to be like that person if I want to be loved. I just started coming to these conclusions on my own, you know, at this really young age. And, you know, my parents um, were wonderful, wonderful parents. They were immigrants. They worked their, their butts off. And they were both, they both worked. My, my dad worked so hard. My mom worked so hard. Um, but they were not there because of, you know, they, they were working. It's, and it's not even, it's, I, you know, they did a, a, the best that they could possibly do. They did so much. Everything was, you know, for our, our well-being. But I just, I felt like I couldn't express that to anybody. So I just, like, took matters into my own hands. And as I grew older and as my body began to change, my first addiction appeared as um, food. And so that was really the began this relationship with food. And the reason why is um, I talked about this. I've talked about this with you. I've talked about this with other people, you know, that feeling of not being a part of something, not being accepted, not being a part of something, having to go and look for something to fill you to be complete. That feeling food began to fill that. And um, I don't, maybe it was like in sixth or seventh grade and we can go on about the reasons why, because I am a girl, but this happens in, you know, both sexes, like, you know, boys and girls where we get, you know, the, all the body image things change, especially during puberty and, and um, our culture, unfortunately provides us with a massive amount of um, just expectations and you know images and pictures of what they believe should be the right size you know and the right the right hair color the right this is and now as I get older it's a whole new whole new of like now this is how you're supposed to look when you age you know you're not supposed to have wrinkles and you're not supposed to um have that bowl you know like bold or and here's how we're going to fix it and so that's a whole other, maybe we'll that's, talk about that another time. Right. <laughs> I, I start to get all hot and bothered about that now because I'm in my 40s. But back <laughs> then it was really about your shape, right? It was mm-hmm. really very much about, okay, the, the skinny girl got the, um, got the love. How about that? That's really what it's about. So the skinny girl got the love. And I was just a little bit overweight. Um, I had never had, I loved food. I loved to eat. Um, I loved all my Polish food. And um, I am not one of those people that could take it or leave it. I like it all. I like all of it. And so it made me feel good. And I quickly realized um, that it made me feel good. Like 
it was like this moment of like, wow, if I eat these candy bars, I feel better, you know, instead of like asking myself a question of like, I'm, I'm depressed, I'm unhappy, I feel lonely, I feel alone. I started, I just, I just, something clicked in me and I was like, eating makes me feel good. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. But then you counter that with this pressure to fit in and to be a part of and not be that way. So my bulimia started at a very early age, somewhere around seventh grade. I made a very conscious decision after, unfortunately, the Tracy Gold episode. I don't know. Do you guys remember? Do you remember that Tracy Gold did from Growing Pains? She did like a lifetime special about anorexia and bulimia. And I watched this lifetime special and I was like, oh, like it gave me an idea. Oh, no. <laughs> I know it just reversed. It did the reverse on me. And so I had this, like, this, you know, we talked about that void or that emptiness. Well, it quickly got filled with food and then it, and then it quickly just became an obsession because if I were filling that void, it was like I was numbing out all of the sensation I was meant to be experiencing, turns out. You're meant to experience all those things. You're meant to, adolescence is hard. Like, That's right. Hmm. It's not supposed to be easy. You know, you are, your, your friends come and go. That's, that's supposed to happen. And you're supposed to learn how to deal with those things. And I just was like, I don't want to learn to deal with any of it. I want to numb all of this experience out. I'm going to focus on what society tells me I need to be and do and look like. And how do I get there? And I'm going to go ahead and put all of my efforts and energy into that. So I did that for a very, very long time. And my first, and then it turned into alcoholism very soon afterwards. And I had my first drink when I was in eighth grade. And I remember it was Mad Dog. And I, (laughs) I, and I was at a sleepover. And I remember I just, they had this, this stuff and I didn't even think about really drinking. I really didn't think about it because I was really involved with my eating disorder. Like that was my solution. You know, that was it. Like, that's how I could do every single day. That's how I could, that's what got me through the day. And when alcohol was introduced, I remember taking that first drink and I want to say that I had like had my, an immediate blackout that first time because I had that first drink and I was like, Oh my gosh, like this is so fast this, it was like this hotness pouring all over me and it just took everything away. Like I very much clearly remember that drink as something clicking in my head and me saying this could work too. And then after that, my, it wasn't, you know, I was like in eighth grade, I was a young eighth grader too. So I was 12 and I wasn't hiding liquor or anything like that. And, you know, I was just a typical kid, teenager, but my thoughts were very different. The eating disorder continued to thrive in my life, but alcohol and drugs slept in as well because they were now new tools that I had in my tool belt um, on how I could live my life and be okay because everything was just about being okay. That's all it was. It was, how am I going to be okay today? I can't deal with this. You know, when you're a teenager, your hormones and everything's out of control. Right. And we, we already are in that place where you're like, you're already in that place where you're like this. I had to just, man, my, I was in this last night. I was talking to my 13 year old who I had forgotten to tell her about plans that I had made. And I was like, Hey, she's like, you forgot to tell me. And I was like, I'm so sorry. I'm not, I will take care of it. Like if it's important to you, we'll, you know, find a solution. She's like, you can't, cannot believe that you forgot to tell me. And that's like how, right? Like that's how you are when you're, you just think everything is, if something is not going the way your immediate, your immediate emotion is, if this doesn't go the way I want it to go, I'm going to die. Like you just think you're going to die. Mm-hmm. And so that is, can you imagine, that's how I live my life until I got sober for the first time at age 20. That was my first bout of sobriety. And I lived my life that way. And then it came back because I soon after relapsed. But still, like, 
I live my life. Like if I don't manage my emotions and this is how I manage them, alcohol and my eating disorder were the ways that I managed them and drugs. I did, I, you know, all the other stuff too, but those were the two big ones. Then I felt like I was going to die. You know, I had the panic attacks and all of that in my body. Luckily, you know, several things that saved my life, I probably would have died. I was a terribly depressed teenager with lots of suicidal thinking, very much all, it was a normal thought for me. Like it was normal. Like maybe I should kill myself today. Like I just would have these thoughts and I thought they were normal. I'm like, no, no, I'm not going to do that. I mean, and so I don't, I don't think that's, you know, looking back at it, I'm like, that's really insane. You know, that's insane. Well, it's not um, like, okay, well, I'm going to go to the grocery store today. I'm going to call my friend. I'm going to go to the park or maybe I'll kill myself. You know, it's yeah. not like supposed to be an option of the, of the day. Right. I mean, I don't want to give, I don't want to, you know, yeah. make light of it at all, but it's true yeah. because I mean, it's so prevalent even today in this crazy time. I mean, and yeah. mental health disorders and those thought, those suicidal thoughts are very, very prevalent. And no, they're not normal. It's not supposed to be like that. No. And, oh, and all of it was because I thought I had to do it by myself. Um, my parents loved me so much. My mom confronted me many times and asked me if there was a problem. She would find things all the time and, and, ask me, I mean, point blank all the time. Are you, do you have a problem with this? And there's like, you know, with liquor missing. Like I remember I was a freshman in high school and the, um, I had a party and, you know, they had all this liquor and, and like, you know, I, I stole it all. I would steal, you know, do all the things that I just thought were normal. I didn't have any problem doing terrible, terrible things to anybody. And um, I know that's hard to believe now. But <laughs> I know, right? Oh my gosh, the dirt's coming out. But I just didn't, I didn't, it was like I was a completely different person. And it really was that I thought I, I can't, you know, it was this place where I was in where definitely I felt like the only solution, the only way that I could survive was if I could get, if I could be in that of numbness the entire time. That's the only way. And then I would bounce between numb and uh, it's not even happiness. It was numb and, and fake elation like that. What I thought was making me happy, which wasn't even making me happy, you know, and, and I thought I was on my own, you know, I thought I was by myself and I thought that I had to control it all um, on my own. That was it. Uh, I mean, and, and so, that's, I mean, that's the power of addictions. Again, we don't want to make light of it. I mean, but that's the power, you know, when people li might be listening to this and they're, they don't understand. I mean, that's it. That's the power of addictions, eating disorders that you do things that are, when you look back on it, it's crazy, you know, crazy, crazy. but it's being it's like, pulled because you have a different, like you said, you have a different goal in mind. The goal is to stay numb or, and control it all, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, survival. Like, right. honestly, it was like that whole, like, this is the only thing that I, this is the, oh, this is my solution. I found something that works. This is my solution. And you know what? It's not only, you know, you have this, this mental thing going on, but actually then, then with alcohol and the drug piece, you develop a real physical physical chemical addiction where even if you try to stop you know you're 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 pulled towards that because of the cravings right the mm -hmm. cravings then turn on and then you're like whoa but I'm trying to stop I want to stop and your body now and that's why it's not just a, a mind it's mind body and then all and then the whole piece is spirit right mm -hmm. the whole piece that's been missing forever is spirit um, and that's why that's disease. It's a mind, body, spirit disease. Both of those, eating disorder and any kind of addiction, really, I think. Mm -hmm. like that. So the yeah. solution, you know, I've heard for addiction is connection. It, it really is connection. Anyway, so that's kind of, uh, where was I? So the first time I got sober, I realized I'll just jump to that, is when I came, I was in college, and this was my first spiritual awakening. I had uh, a roommate who also um, smoked a lot of pot and we just had a real good time. 
I disconnected from like my family, my good friends, my, my good friends that were like, that cared about me. I kind of just disconnected from them. My best friend was actually, my best friend in the whole world was actually at the same college. And I just was, I just had no interest in her. I was like, I don't even, I don't even want to see her. And we were like away at school, you know, um, I just wanted to start a new life with nobody in it. And so I was on a pathway and that freshman year of of college was, um, was actually a gift, but yeah, it was, was a blur, complete blur. I don't remember much of it. So many, without getting too down and dirty, there were several times that I'd woken up in a blackout. You know, I had been either molested or there had been times where, um, I'd been raped. Um, I didn't even know. I had no memory, no recollection other than my body, you know, being in a way or even uh, my uh, my friends would be like, wow, like you went crazy last night. And, you know, and I have different definitions of, of rape now than I did before. You know, I, I was out of my mind. Um, I absolutely, you know, had, again, like the memory completely, like that's not normal, you know, but again, I believed that this was normal, like, and it was the college experience. And I knew though, my body knew, and I think my spirit knew that there was something very, very wrong because I hit a bottom, um, at the end of that year, I came home from college and I just had a a breakdown. And I locked myself in my bedroom and crying and for days, I wouldn't come out. And finally, my mom came up and I really didn't recognize the, like, I didn't verbalize that alcohol and drugs were a problem. The eating disorder was tearing me apart so much at that time. It was, it was, like I said, it was my, that was my first love, you know, my first friend. And uh, it was backfiring on me. It wasn't working anymore. And um, that's really the first time where I realized something is not working. And it was a spiritual thing like that woke me up. And I, you know, my mom came to me and she's like, do you want to be locked up? And I said, yes. I just was like, I cannot, I don't want to die. I, I knew I didn't want to die. And I knew, um, and I knew I couldn't do it by myself. So I remember like the moment of that. And so um, what happened was we didn't have insurance that would cover a lot. So we ended up doing like, she took me to uh, my uh, pediatrician and like we worked everything out. So I went into like a, a really intense outpatient treatment program. And then I also continued to do group therapy several times a week and therapy several times. This was like very much like a treatment center, but it was, all done outpatient. And then I stayed home. I didn't go back to school. And so I made the choice to get sober without really saying I need to quit drinking. I just was 20 and or I wasn't even 20. I was 19 actually. So I was 19. So I shouldn't have been drinking anyway, (laughs) but it was like a choice of that kind of taking a side route, but the eating disorder was what I wanted. What was the problem at that time? I wanted to be done with it. So that was my first moment of clarity and I continued with the treatment and I saw that there is hope and a way out and I did that for I stayed with treatment um now uh it it kind of came down to you know I was like every single day after after whatever I had to do I had you know my program I had to do um and then you know I was better so I was getting better and I was like well now I can just go twice a week and my mom was like because she's She's like, I want to see her daughter get better and sees that I'm getting better. So I did. And I started, now a year goes by and now I'm in my second year and I decide I can move out. I'm good now. I can move out of your house. I'm healthy now. I can go do, I can go downtown. I can go to school. I went downtown. I went to college down to Columbia College downtown and continued my education there. Was on fire for school. Kept going. Therapy sliding down and down, going to maybe once a week now and doing fine on my own, started picking up drinking again. I turned 21. You know, I was like 21. I can drink now. I took a big break. 
And so that's just how it kind of crept back. Alcohol crept back in. I quit therapy after another two years and uh, was just kind of going to group maybe once every three or four weeks. And um, I just decided I could do this now on my own. I can manage this on my own. I got this now. And that's when it happened again. So I had another relapse and I started with, started with bulimia again, went straight back to bulimia again quickly. And it went straight to horrible bulimia where lots of, you know, intentional binging, intentional, you know, it wasn't just like, oh, I ate too much. It was like, I'm going to go and eat seven burgers and I'm going to go through this drive through and I'm going to throw up there and then I'm going to go to this next place over here down the street. I'm going to do that and I'm going to come home and then I'm going to be really numb, but I'm still feeling comfortable. So I'm going to do that again. It was just to the point and that feeling came back awfully quick, but, um, and you know, again, alcohol was there, you know, uh, as well. This just kind of escalated until and I started doing yoga and this is the yoga piece that you know you know me so well for because I started with Pilates actually a lot of people don't know that is that I started with Pilates and when I got into a Pilates class for the first time I was just looking for like toning (laughs) but I got in and I laid down on this mattress and it was the reformer and I remember I was like I just want to be toned I want a flat stomach and my coach uh, Patrick who's amazing and I love him he he was like, you know, it's not just about that. He's like, let's take 10 deep breaths. You know, and I remember I was like laying on, I was like, 10 deep breaths. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm like, no, like, I want to do the 100. I want to do. Yeah. Let's get busy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, but I listened to him for some reason. I don't know why. And uh, I did what he told me to do. And, um, and the eating disorder started slowing down a little bit. I started feeling my body for the first time ever. I never had felt in a, a part of my body before. So the love for my body and being in my body began then. So I would have more spaces between episodes, you know, because I was still, you know, once you go into recovery at least one time, you know, you have, you know, you have a problem and then you go into recovery, you know, you have a problem. And then if you have a relapse, like you just can never go back to that. You just, you know, you're screwed forever. If you don't, (laughs) yeah, if you don't deal with it, right. Right. If you don't work with it, but it, I had fewer episodes and everything. And so Pilates, then I remember doing Pilates and feeling so good, having less and less episodes of my eating disorder being, you know, drinking was always there, but it didn't feel like it was out of control. And uh, I remember saying to Patrick, Hey, I think I want to do this for a living. Do you think I could be a Pilates teacher? And he was like, you totally could. And that's when I started my training. So I was like 23 and I went through a very intensive Pilates training. Now at the same time, the studio was across this, across from a little like yoga studio. And I would see like hundreds and hundreds, like hundreds and hundreds, all <laughs> but literally there was like a, a hundred pairs of shoes out front of the studio and it always smelled like incense. And when the people would leave, they would walk out and they'd be like, Oh, and they would like, look like they were floating, right? Like floating out of the studio. And I was like, I want what they have. <laughs> that right. was my first like, thought. I mean, what are they doing in there? I want what they have. And they look at, they look peaceful. It was like what I had been missing so much is that is that is what I saw. Right. So I was like, I started right away. I got in there and like, you know, true worker B, I was like, Hey, so my, my guru there was Suda Wexler at the Chicago yoga center. He's uh, amazing. And I walked in, you know, and I'm like, I just want to do the teacher training. Like, right away. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, how long have you been practicing? And I think I was like, I don't know, maybe like three months or so. But I had from my first practice of yoga, a spiritual experience. I felt from the moment I stepped on my mat that there was something going on. And I felt like not only was I tapping into my body in a way I had never felt before, 
but I, there was something else and it was in the stillness. And that's kind of what you were talking about in the beginning. Um, and I know I might be rambling a lot, that stillness part, you know, that portion that we all had a hard time getting and achieving and being in, that was where I met God. And I'd never met God before like that. And I'd been raised Catholic. I believed in God, but through, like, it was like, I had to get quiet. You know, I was never quiet. I was never quiet. I was make, I was always busy making so much noise so that I didn't have to like see what was there. And because we, I didn't want to see what was there. Go ahead. Cause you don't want to No, I know, but that's, no. I mean, that is so much it. Like we, we get busy with life. We get busy with all of our things and the true blessings are in when we sit down, but we don't want to sit down, right? And we don't want to get quiet because then we have to, deal with all the things, you know, and, um, but when we, um, and I've said this in, you know, other times, I mean, there's times for, you know, doing all the things and working hard and moving forward, but there is a lot of times that it's good to just be quiet and we can, we can find that, right. We can find that in the yoga studio or, you know, more so in the yoga, at least for me than Pilates, but you can find that Mm -hmm. stillness. Mm -hmm. And when you still yourself down, then you can hear, right? Yeah. You can yeah, hear from absolutely. God or spirit, whoever you, you know, and that's a lot of times when the answers come. But we're so afraid yeah. to slow down because yeah. then you're not yeah. going to, then who are you, right? If you're not accomplishing, if you're not doing all the things, who are you, right? Yeah, afraid absolutely. Of yeah. yeah, and for so long, like especially with, with me and with a lot of people I know, it's like who I thought I was you know, I just spent my entire life being who I wanted you, who I thought you wanted me to be. That's really all I did. I spent all my energy trying to be who my teachers wanted me to be, trying to be who my friends wanted me to be, trying to be who my, who my boyfriends wanted me to be, because that's what I, that was for some reason that affirmation was pleasing to me. That made me feel, oh, I'm going to be exactly what I think you want me to be. And that makes me feel good now because I know that you like me now, you know, and that was like a big portion of it is that again, it's like a U-turn, right? You know, yoga is like a U-turn <laughs> because it's like, Oh, okay. We're back to, uh, we're back to me not feeling loved again. It always points back to me not feeling loved. And the only way that I thought I could feel love was through the validation of others. Mm-hmm. And that was the whole thing. And so getting to that quiet place and that still place, oh my gosh, now my most favorite, favorite, favorite thing to teach is yin, yin yoga. And I remember my first yin yoga class very clearly too, because I had been doing a shanga and I was like a shanga on fire and I'm vinyasa and, and I, you know, I hadn't tried hot yoga yet, but I was really, really doing a lot of vinyasa. I did, and I yeah, wanted to... I didn't know you do. I try just to break in, but you know, I yeah. um, a place that I've gone to over here introduced me to Ashtanga, which is super hard. I'm like, what is this? And um, I didn't know you were trained in that because I've just known you for your vinyasa flow. I mean, yeah. you go see Laura and you do a lot of vinyasa flows, you know, yeah. sun salutations it's, and all that. Ashtanga was my first um, practice that I, so that Chicago Yoga Center, uh, Center was a, a, um, Hatha, Iyengar, and Ashtanga hmm. um, studio. And that was all they did. And then they did yin too. They ended up coming in and bringing in yin. But yeah, Ashtanga is my home. Like that's where hmm. I grew up is Ashtanga. And the, but the yin class I walked into, I didn't know what it was. It just said like yoga, right? And I, yin yoga. And I just thought, well, I've never taken anything, but everything there has been awesome. So I walked in and it was like, as we sat there, it was like sitting there and it was like, I was just like, what? I kept like sitting. I kept looking up, like looking around and then no words, no one's talking. I'm like, what's going on? Like, and I sit down again. I put my head down, wait some more. Nope. Still same pose. Like it was so awful. I was so, <laughs> so uncomfortable because at least in vinyasa and at least in Ashtanga, you're moving and breathing, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. You're not moving at all. It was like, you're sitting 
good luck, Charlie. You need to sit and just be there in this awful hip opener pose for five to 10 minutes. And I, it sounds terrible, but yin is the best thing in the entire world. <laughs> but um, now I say that, but that was the, I remember I took that class and I was like, wow, like what the hell was that? Now fast forward a couple of years later and I'm doing, I did the training with Paul Grilly there, which has changed my life forever. So, um, you know, you talked about meeting God there and, and that stillness and how important that is because I don't do anything without talking to God now. I don't even know. Um, I don't make any decisions. I don't, I don't do this pod. I mean, before I got on the podcast, I, I just said, Hey, like God, your words, my mouth, like this isn't up to me anymore. And I think that's the biggest transition. Um, God led me to, you know, I'm in another recovery program too. And for my alcohol, um, but you know, God, it's all, it all ended up being healed together in one beautiful package, like one beautiful package because the addictions were so interwoven. And I feel really, really, really grateful for that. Uh, some people need to seek out different pathways, you know, to, you know, specifically conquer this one, this one, and this one over here. But for me, like the recovery program that I found, like, really helped me with everything. And that's because it all pointed to that one thing, which was what was missing, which was always God. Well, because um, I, I remember hearing you uh, speak, you know, tell your story another time. And that's what you, mm -hmm. I remember you saying that, that you realized there was this emptiness, right? As you talked in the beginning, that there was yeah. like, you're seeking something and like, where is all of yeah. that? And there was this emptiness that you wanted to fill but you realize that it really could only be filled by, by the love of God, yeah. by the love of our Still. Savior. Yeah. Yeah. Still. It can't be filled by money, cannot be filled by things, cannot be filled by success. You know, sometimes I get confused and I think that, oh, like, you know, like I, cause you know, you're growing older and you see like your, your friends and your, um, you know, I would say they're my teammates. Right. But it's like my, like just my, my fellow, my fellow teachers and, you know, doing whatever. And I was, I need to be like that. I mean, no, uh -uh. <laughs> like God's always saying, and he's always saying to me, just slow down. He's saying like, just slow down. And um, the only way for me to really truly be happy and to really truly experience joy the way that I want to experience it is by being able to, to follow his, um, and I call it God, you know, some people call it spirit. Sometimes I say spirit too, um, but I do call it God and, and the universal energy, whatever you want to call it. There's nothing that could have um, saved me like that. So. Yeah. And it's, yeah. um, and it's tough. Cause I, um, say this for myself. Um, you know, it's tough to surrender to that, to, to put that first, as opposed to, like you said, the, <clears throat> yeah, the success or the striving to put that first, but to put him first or that spirit first or that, you know, energy first and to surrender into that, mm -hmm. that ain't easy. And I'm still, you know, still working, you know, still working on, on that. And, and as we continue to do it, just like you taught me in yoga, as we continue to do the practice, it just is easier to to, to settle in. Right. And it's easier to be there. It's easier for me to be present. It's like, I finally got it. I'm like, okay, it's now, but you know, but then there's other days that it ain't so easy. But again, that's mm -hmm. why I, and I talked about this on another podcast. That's why some days you're like, I think I need to go and do a yoga class. And then you leave feeling like you had some therapy and you went to church mm -hmm. and you yeah. know, you worked out <laughs> yeah. all of the same thing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, that's so true. Yeah. I know. Well, meditation is like that. And, you know, uh, meditation has been become like a huge part of my life. And, you know, you're meditating when you're doing yoga. Mm -hmm. So that's what that is. Like you're, it's just your, your choice of um, just how are you, how do you get there? We're mm -hmm. all looking, we all, we just want to get to that quiet place, right? Mm -hmm. So however you get to that quiet place, like that's what, and we need to practice getting there and and spending time there. Like we need to practice getting there and we need to practice spending time Staying there. And I have people, right. yeah. And, and, and it's un, as uncomfortable as it can be sometimes, but then you, like you said, you just, 
learn because you benefit if you continue to do it, you keep doing it, you just learn, wow, like, and you know, it's, it's not by chance, like, there's like, there's something happening in your brain, there's mm-hmm. neuro, you know, that we have this neuroplasticity, we have, these, you know, these neurological connections that are forming and at our pleasure center, when we leave yoga, and we notice how much better we feel, like, we remember how we mm-hmm. felt. And so the more you do it, it works like that. The more you do it, um, the more you'll come back, right? The more you do it, the more you know it now, now. That's the first thing I'm going to do now. You know, like when I think about, and I have different ways to get, it's really the meditation piece that is all of it, right? That's what it, the stillness is in the meditation piece. But I have different ways to get there as to a lot of people, like, Mm -hmm you know, depending on where you are in your journey, like some people, they're not ready to sit quietly with their knees crossed or whatever, and just close their eyes. They just, they're they're like, shoot me now. Like, I can't do that. (laughs) Right. 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 They have to get, you know, they have to get to, they have to go in and move their body, you know? And a lot of that is because, you know, we've talked about that is because your body remembers your body. You know, there's a wonderful book, called the body keeps the score your body remembers everything that has ever ever happened to you before you could even process you know I the moment I was nine months old and I really wanted to be held but I wasn't held guess what remembers that my body remembers that it's truth like we have that stored in our body so when you're in yoga and you're in these postures that are being held that you're exploring and you have that contemplation that happens and it's you teachers guiding you in a way that um, you can't help, you know, and you can't run away. You know, some people do, they get up and leave. Right. I always see that. I'm always like, all right, that's okay. Come back tomorrow. It's all good. But you know, they're just like not ready. Right. You just not ready to look at it. But if you can stay there and stick it out, then not only is the energy released because you're acknowledging it, you are acknowledging it by being in the pose, right? You're breathing, which is prana. Prana is your life force. So the breath like injecting into that is like water, like cleansing that area, right? And then the exhalation is the release, right? The last thing you do, exhale. Like it's out it goes. So, you know, you're physically cleansing your body you're mentally cleansing your body. And then if you're willing to open up a little bit, then you're also spiritually, you're also spiritually opening. Well, yeah. And it's amazing. And I really encourage people if they're listening going, okay, I don't think, but it's like, just, just try it and continue to do Mm -hmm. it and to continue to practice it. Cause I mean, you've seen me plenty of times where I'm crying at the end of class and, you know, not sure why, you know, but that's the good stuff. And then I'm in the midst of taking a a course called mindfulness based stress reduction course uh, for eight weeks. And we do a lot of body scan, you know, part of the part of it's the body scan meditation. So I'm practicing it every day, 30 to 40 minutes. And I did one um, last week, and everything was good. And then I started to get to my heart. And like, I like started to cry as she was coming up over my heart and breathing there. And then, and then I released it and I was like, wow, what was that all about? And I knew it was what it was about because I knew what I was thinking about and it was Mm -hmm. something that was very hurtful. And again, and so, but, but again, when people listen to things like this they are like, that's weird, but you know what? It's just, as we talked about it in the class, the body Mm -hmm. remembers like it knows, like the emotion was stored there because yeah. I had been hurt by something had, that had been said to me. And so when I got to my heart and I thought about that, I was sad. So I felt yeah. that emotion. And it, so it's really, that's, I mean, I just love to continue to learn all of this because it's just, mm-hmm. if you're yeah. willing to, like you said, be still and to sit and to listen, there's just so much healing, learning, recovery. And, and I think, when we look at recovery too, just to mention that, you know, your brain remembers that and you want to go back because, and those other things just don't have the same pull, you know, mm-hmm. and that you're like, I'm going to go here because this feels really good. Like yeah. in a really cool, authentic way. Yeah. Well, you discover, you know, you discover, you discover love, like you discover self love, like really that's what you discovered for the first time ever. 
And once you, once you discover that and you're shown that, and then you develop that relationship, you know, and have like contact with, you know, your spirit or God or whatever, then you remember, you like, again, like goes back to, again, that U-turn. Oh, that's what I've been looking for since I was five or six. That's all I ever wanted was to know that I was okay. That's all I ever wanted was to know that I was safe and secure and looked after. All I ever wanted to know that I was loved and no matter what. And that's, uh, and you can't, the thing is, you can be told this stuff by your parents. You can be told this stuff by your friends. You don't believe it until you believe it. Right. You just don't. You know? <laughs> that's right. You don't. You're just like, you don't believe what they say until you believe it yourself, like you first, right? right? So, you know, all the times my mom was like crying and she was like, I love you so much. Like, why can't I help you? And I was just like, nothing. No, I couldn't even hear it because I was so full of shame. I didn't even realize like why I didn't want to hear that. My body, my heart, my mind like was so full of shame. I, I just like couldn't accept it. I was like, I, I can't even accept this. Mm-hmm. I'm nothing. You know, that's what I thought. I'm nothing. Right. Right. So how am I supposed to like, it was just like, no. And so, um, you know, just, I think it's important. I love that, that story about your meditation because like I've had that happen to me so many times and it's that acknowledgement of the feeling and knowing that it'll pass. Like, Right. Where was that? When I, was, I never learned that. Like, <laughs> like, oh, like I'm feeling sadness and this will pass. And I think we experience that in yoga a lot because we are in like a pose and you get mad. Like a lot of people get angry, you know, when they're in yoga and I see it in their faces. It just cracks me up. Like, I'm like, oh, I see your face. You, because our, our, everything's written on your face. Everything's written on your face. And it is our best like guide. Like when you look at someone, you can see see exactly what they're going through by just their face, you know, their eyebrows or, you know, the smile is the obvious one. Right. Right. But like, you can see even like in the lines, the creases in their eyes and the creases, like, do they, if they smell a lot, if they frown a lot, are they mad? Like you can read it all. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you can see that. And so it's just, uh, it's really interesting in yoga seeing these people get super mad. I'm like, okay, but guess what? You get mad. You take a deep breath. You take a second. It's over. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I know you, you are. It, right? Yeah. I know you're raising girls these days. And I mean, how is, you know, what do you tell your girls, you know, since you've obviously gone through growing up and those struggles yeah. and things are a little tough now. And, you know, yeah. what do you tell your girls these days about self-love or um, mm-hmm. the things that you've I, learned? I uh, try to make sure that they know that they are loved no matter what. I mean, that's the big one. And not just by me. Like, I mean, we're um, a busy family. So we are in and out of church. We definitely don't uh, make enough time to get involved. But they're both in their, they're both in like youth groups and things like that. that. Not that that, not that that is like this, you know what everyone should do but I I want to make sure they have a relationship with a higher power um and I can't even control that too right but the biggest thing for me is that our your example right so as long as I can stay sober and they can see also the time and energy that I direct to not only creating space to talk to God but um, creating space to take care of myself. I like, I really always, that always, again, here's the U-turn again. It just points back to you. The better we feel, the better they feel. And I think that really says something about that. Yeah, I mean, I can't, again, I can't speak to that enough because I've, and again, if you've listened to my podcast, you've heard different stories and, and, and that's certainly, that's what I've learned during this journey of my daughter's mm-hmm. struggle. Like I have to take care of myself. I need to be the living example of yes. self-love and self-care and giving up that shame and giving up that guilt and giving up that. And it ain't easy and it is a daily practice. And so, yes. and I do it every day and you do it every day. And I think that that's the best, that's the best that we can do. And I want moms to hear that, that are listening because we are, so, we're moms and we just want to take care of everybody. We want to make sure we're control freaks, right? And we are codependents yeah. and we just want everybody happy. 
But the way to make everybody happy is we can't make everybody happy, but we need to start with ourselves and get ourselves mm-hmm. happy and grounded and be an example. Mm-hmm. And others yeah. will, and ex, you know, your girls will see that you're, you know, our kids will mm-hmm. see that and mm-hmm. see that example of what it's like to take care of themselves and put themselves yeah. first. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's, a, that's exactly it. I, I make sure that they, in terms of like food and and all of that too, you know, I, I'm very aware of that, you know, I watch that and like a hawk. And so we hopefully, I'm, I, it looks so far that everyone has a good relationship with food. My, both my daughters are, at, you know, athletes too. Like, so it's a, uh, it's, that's, you know, interesting. That's really fun to watch, fun to see. But yeah, I think you're right on with continuing. I think the, the more, I work on myself, the, the more connected I am to God on a daily basis, the more I rely on that. And, um, and that's the best example, you know, we're like, the, we're like, they take from our overflow, right? I heard that description once too, is like, if we fill ourselves up, what are you filling yourself up with? Like, are you filling yourself up with like crap? Like, I always think about that. I'm like, Okay, so if I fill myself up with crap, like this even with nutrition or whatever, right? Even like Netflix, you know, if I fill myself up with that, like they're going to get crap, like no matter what. Like if I fill myself up with positivity and good energy and, you know, and, and stillness and, and, and God and love, if I fill myself up with love, like that's what's going to pour off of me. So I just really I like that. that. Yeah, image of a fountain, right? Isn't it mm-hmm. cool? Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. You know, as we kind of wrap this up, you mentioned one book, um, The Body Keeps the Score. I mean, and I know you've read to me in yoga classes and things like that. And so I know that you're mm-hmm. a reader and a writer. But are there any yeah. books that like that you love today that, that help you or that have helped you along your journey that you think others should hear about? Yeah, well, I mean, if you, there's a lot of books out there, man, but here you know, I am a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and I don't, we don't really bring that up at all in any sort of like media standpoint, but the book that helped me if you are in addiction or if you struggle with alcoholism at all is the big book. So that's the number one. And then the second book that I, I've actually been loving lately, like I've read Marianne Williamson pretty much every single book that she, <laughs> that she's written. So anything by Marianne Williamson is amazing. Return to Love is like the, one of the most beautiful books that I've ever read. I can, I can continue to go back to that book. And I mean, I go back to it maybe every one or two years and I will read it again. And I just, and my mind is blown again. I'm just like, what? Like I, again, like I learned again. I've recently started, I see not loving Gabrielle Bernstein, like a long time ago. I didn't, I, I kind of was, this is a little too mainstream for me. So I was like, eh. But now I love her. So I just actually read The Judgment Detox by her. And then she has another book that I just read called, um, what's it called? I'll tell you right now. Yeah, um, I was, yeah, I just learned about Gabby Bernstein uh, a few, a few months ago. Yeah. And I've listened to some yeah. of her things and done some of her meditations. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. She's, she's lovely. She is I know, lovely. I, was, I, I kind of like, um, you know, I resisted her for a while, but I don't know, you know, you just do. Right. And then of course, like, you know, all, if you're, I related the book that really, I, the first person I ever related to reading, um, when I was a mom, young, young, when I was a young mom, realized getting sober was Glenn and Doyle. So her first book, of course, carry on warrior, which she had that compilation of, it was really a compilation of her blog. So if you ever, I mean, if you read that book, you'll, and if you think you've got any sort of addiction, you read that book, you'll just see yourself in her story. Like it was like my story was being said to me. And I just remember she's so powerful. And she's obviously written another book too since then. Untamed. 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 Yeah, I'm reading. I'm halfway yeah. through Untamed. Yeah. Yeah. I love, yeah. Yeah. It's a good one. Yeah. So, oh my gosh, there's so many. I don't even, yeah. Yeah. I can't even tell you. There's so many good books out there. Oh, and I'll tell you, this new guy, well, The Universe Has Your Back, that's the book I was talking about by Gwen, mm. by uh, Gabrielle Bernstein and um, Dawson Church, this new guy, Dawson Church, that I just found. Now, heads up, this is more, uh, probably in your, it, you'll probably love this because you're a geek like me because it's all about the brain. 
So he's talking about neuroplasticity. It's called mind to matter. And um, it definitely requires some coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Dawson Church, if you're listening. But no, it's like he is so intelligent. It's all about how um, it's actual. If you're a scientist and you're like, ah, I'm skeptical how this, how yoga and this can ever work on me. You need to listen to this or read this book because he actually gives like the science, all the scientific evidence. It's like, thank you very much for all of the quantum physics. I appreciate it. Oh, good. Um, but it is very, very techy, very quantum physics brain. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, but um, some people, like some that. people need that. I mean, I just interviewed a gal that does Akashic record readings and I just was out of town a couple of days with my girlfriends and one of them does Akashic record readings and she does all of the, mm-hmm the cards and stuff like that and all that, you know, it was amazing the stuff that, you know, she did a reading with me. And when you say, you're like, how did you, it just makes it, and you know, it makes complete sense, but you're like, Mm -hmm. how did that work by you turning over some silly card, right? That led to this whole discussion about what's going on in my life and what needs to go on in my life and all that stuff. So yeah, yeah, I do like the the geeky stuff and again, the quantum physics, because it does help Mm -hmm. for those that need that it's a good way for people to understand this whole idea of energy, spirit, you know, things it's that been are around being- for thousands of years. Like right. people don't understand. Like one thing is that it's been around for thousands and thousands of years. Like we're just now coming back to it more in this century, you know, mm-hmm. but it's been it's around not, forever. You know, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So. You know, as we wrap it up, like what would you have any final words for, um, we'll tell people where you're, you know, I'll leave in the show notes uh, where oh. you are because you are a Pilates instructor and I think teaching, are you still teaching yoga down in Austin yeah. too? Yeah, absolutely. So. Yeah, I have a website. It's um, harmony, harmonylab.net. So www.harmonylab.net. And um, I do Pilates, yoga, meditation, and Reiki. And that's been um, really awesome. And so I have a little studio um, that I teach Pilates and I do with some private yoga. And then I also teach yoga at Baptiste Power Yoga Austin. And I do some community classes. Um, if, you're, uh, if you live in, rough ho- in the Rough Hollow neighborhood, those are my, they're really large, but they're really fun. They're on the lake. It's like resort style mm. on the lake. It's beautiful. Yeah. And actually I have a workshop coming up a yin yoga workshop that is uh, in Austin. And if you wanted to do that, you could also do it virtually. So if you have any questions, that's going to be through Baptiste Power Yoga. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah. I mean, what any last words of um, wisdom or again, what you'd want to leave, um, hmm. leave the listeners about? Um, it's fine time. I want to just say like, take the time, like, it's more important if anyone, any moms out there or anything like it, the most important thing you could do is find the time or find the tool. Like, again, it doesn't have to be yoga. It doesn't have to be, I'm sitting still. The thing that takes you to that quiet place, like discover what that is. There's 30 different ways. There's so many different ways to get there. It could be gardening. It could be playing music. It could be painting. It doesn't look the same for everyone but find a way to get to that quiet place and then practice it because it will change your life forever. You don't even know how magnificent, how fulfilled, how amazing. It's just waiting on the other side. So it's just, you know, and it doesn't, again, it doesn't have to look like my routine, like, or your routine, like the place that takes you to peace, the place that takes you to the quiet place. And uh, that you're never alone. Like, you're just not alone. There's so many people struggling. Everyone, like you said, everyone's got a story to tell. Yeah. That's it. (laughs) Yeah, that's it. Yeah, well, I am so grateful to, I just have loved our conversation. I really have. And uh, I know others Mm -hmm. will love it too. But it's just always so nice. Again, I'm forever grateful for you for introducing me to that, to the power of yoga and the power of, again, that stillness and really getting... um, And as I shared with my husband the other day, when he was talking about, you know, a lot of emotions are stored in your hips. I'm like, no kidding. I know who I learned that from, (laughs) right? I I learned all about that with uh, so much is stored in our body. But again, we get on that mat and it gives us a place to, um, 
to really heal and again, listen to God and be filled by that. So I'm so thankful that you were here today and I'm just so grateful that you're a friend of mine. I really do love you and uh, love love that we spent time today. So I know me too. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. And again, as we continue on with our love fest here, um, again, thanks for listening, everybody. I really appreciate you coming back. Do share these episodes. Um, People do need to hear the stories and I do appreciate that you share and that you come back and listen and um, we'll talk to you next time. Thanks for listening. If you like this podcast, head over to iTunes and leave me a five-star review. Share it with others and make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a thing. I've got a tribe over on Facebook, so head over there and search for Juggling the Chaos of Recovery Podcast Tribe. And do you know somebody who has a story, a story to share, a story of recovery and hope? Please let me know, as I'd love to feature them as a guest on one of these next upcoming podcasts. And perhaps you're looking for a community of like-minded, collaborative, and supportive people who cheer each other on as we strive to improve our lives. If that sounds like something you've been looking for, schedule some time with me. You'll find the links in the show notes. Let's talk, and let me help you find your way. And I'm here to tell you that you're worth it.